Welcome to Cognitive Psychology, and I will be your lecturer, Angelo and Monte Verde. For this lesson, the re reading list or the reference that we are using is Robert Sternberg and Karen Sternberg, um, Cognitive Psychology 6th edition. All right, so for this topic number two, or lesson number two, we're going to discuss the cognitive neuroscience. And First, we have to tackle what is cognitive neuroscience. By the way, it is the field of studies linking the brain and other aspects of the nervous system to cognitive processing and ultimately to behavior. So meaning to say that the um, behavior or the attitude of, the per of a person or a human being or an animal that is somehow related or connected with um, how the brain works. All right, so on this picture, we have here frontal lobe, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobe. So we're going to discuss each one and dissect what's inside of this brain. Okay, so first, before we proceed, we have to identify what is the brain. It is the organ in our bodies that most directly controls our thoughts, emotions, and motivations. So we need to see um, with whatever you are doing, it is responsible of the what's inside of your brain. Okay, what's happening inside of your brain is, is related to how you act, how you react to a certain situation. And we also have the localization of function. It is refers to specific areas of the brain that controls specific skills or behavior so with this picture we have here just to repeat the frontal lobe which is for this one this will be in the forehead or um, malapit sa noo parietal will be the sapuyo occipital malapit ito sa batok and temporal which is in the temple or sa may tainga malapit okay so Nervous system is connected with the brain because um, it is the basis for our ability to perceive, adapt, and interact with the world around us. Through this system, we receive, process, and then respond to information from the environment. So, um, if whatever our brain tells us to do, um, it serves as a connection to our movement, whatever what we see on the environment it serves a signal to our brain and because of that one everything functions well because of the nervous system because it connects on how we perceive the environment okay and there are three regions of the brain we have forebrain midbrain hindbrain and neutral um this three Okay, and we have here the neutral tube. Um, five weeks inside of the womb, um, you will be developed this kind of um, regions of the brain. However, as time goes by, as you go older inside of the womb of your mother, um, it expands and some of this brain vanish and it evolves. Okay, not literally vanish, vanish but it evolves. All right. And this is how it looks. You have your cerebral hemisphere, the midbrain, this will be located on this part, cerebellum, medulla, and the spinal cord. And let's see what are the functions of each region. We also have the, what are now the major part of the brain, as what I said earlier. All right, so we have here the let's start with midbrain uh with forebrain okay the forebrain is responsible for processing of sensory information it helps also with reasoning and problem solving and it regulates autonomic endocrine and motor function so generally the farthest forward or toward what becomes the face okay it is compromises the cerebral cortex the basal ganglia and the limbic system the thalamus and hypothalamus and each of that one has different function that is why the forebrain is responsible for processes sensory information and so on and so forth it's because of the 
localization of the specific region inside of the forebrain, we have cerebral cortex, basal ganglia, limbic system, and thalamus and hypothalamus. All right. We also have on the forebrain the cerebral cortex, okay, which is the outer layer. We're going to discuss that one further. We also have there a basal ganglia. Okay. So in the hind brain, we also um, this is for it helps to regulate autonomic functions and relays uh, sensory information, coordinate movement, and maintain balance in equilibrium. So we're going to discuss later what's inside of the hind brain. That is why it functions that kind of way. Okay. Next would be the mid brain. So mid brain it helps to regulate movement and processes auditory and visual information. So this is how it look, looks like. Okay, so in the forebrain, we have cerebral cortex. Okay, with this part, this will be a cerebral cortex. This is the outer layer of the cerebral hemisphere. We also have the basal ganglia, which is this part, or in singular term, it is ganglion. These are connections of neurons, neurons crucial to motor function. This function of the basal ganglia can result to motor deficits. Okay, it includes tremor, involuntary movements, it also changes in posture, muscle, stone, and slowness of movement. Example, if you will be have, um, have difficulty or if you have damage in basal ganglia, more likely you will be get a kind of disease which is Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease because as what I was saying earlier, this, is, this part is for involuntary movements. So, you will experience yung mga panginig, such as tremors, okay? Just like what is happening on Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. Okay? We also have limbic system. Alright, for this, I do not have a limbic system here, but this is also in part with forebrain. The function of limbic system, it is important to emotion, motivation, memory, and learning. Our limbic system help us to adapt our behavior flexibly in response to our changing environment all right so inside of that limbic system we have septum okay so what is this septum it involves anger and fear so this is responsible for anger and fear we also have here amygdala what is the amygdala for amygdala it plays an important role in emotion as well especially in anger and aggression Damage or if you have a lesion to your amygdala or removal of amygdala can result to, mal, uh, to maladaptive adaptive lack of fear. So example would be autism. We also have hippocampus, alright? So it influences learning and memory, memory. So what is this hippocampus? It is like a seahorse. Um, like inside of our brain or in our for, for brain, um, there, it is responsible or in, uh, essential role in memory formation. People who have suffered damage or removal of the hippocampus still can recall existing memories. However, um, they are unable to form new memories. Okay? Example would be you are, you remember the past things in your life, just like your childhood. However, if you have a damage in your hippocampus, you, are, you will be unable to create new memories because of hippocampus already damaged, okay? And damage of hippocampus can result to Korsakoff syndrome as well, okay? So we also have thalamus. Thalamus, it really sensory information to cerebral cortex. So what thalamus for? It release incoming sensory information to groups of neurons that project to the appropriate region in the cortex. The thalamus also helps in the control of sleeps and walking. When the thalamus malfunction, the results can be pain, tremor, amnesia, impairment of language, and disruption in walking, and also in sleeping. In cases of schizophrenia, imaging in vivo studies reveal that abnormal changes in the thalamus all right so these abnormalities results in difficulties in filtering stimuli and focusing attention which in turn can explain why people suffering from schizophrenia and experience 
symptoms such as hallucination and delusion. However, inside of the thalamus, there are lots of brain chemicals that is responsible of that one. That is why also people with schizophrenia experiencing hallucinations. Okay, so um, we have different of neurochemicals that is responsible for thalamus as well. We also have here hypothalamus. So it regulates the temperature, eating, sleeping, and endocrine system. So the thalamus regulates behavior related to the species survival, such as fighting, feeding, and fleeing, and also in mating. Hypothalamus also is active in regulating emotions and reactions to stress. The hypothalamus also is active in sleep, as what I was saying earlier, dysfunction and neural loss within the hypothalamus are noted in cases of necrolepsy, whereby a person falls asleep often and at unpredictable times. So we need to say, if your hypothalamus get damaged or um, something is happening inside of your hypothalamus, since that this is responsible for sleep, you will experience a necrolepsy disorder. So these are the people who keeps on falling asleep without even noticing that they are sleeping already. Okay, so you, you might want to research what um, narcolepsy rather narcolepsy is so that you can get what I mean on this one. But basically and technically, these are the people who fall asleep easily without noticing. Okay, so um, they fall asleep anytime. So it's unpredictable times. There is no specific hour for that one. And also, hypothalamus is important for functioning of endocrine system. It is also involved in the stimulation of the pituitary gland through which is a range of hormones are produced and released. Alright? So, we also have midbrain. Okay? With this context. So, can you please double check where is the midbrain for this one? Okay, so let's go back to the previous slide. So where is the midbrain located? Okay, so this one will be on this part. Okay, so midbrain will be for this part. Um, the midbrain, it helps to control eye movement and coordination. So this is located on this part. The midbrain is important in non-mammals where it is the main source of con means of control for visual and auditory information inside of midbrain we also have ras or the reticular activating system or um, it is important in controlling consciousness sleep arousal attention cardiorespiratory function and also in movements so the ras also extends into the heat brain so heat brain will be located on this part both the ras and the thalamus are essential for us for having a conscious awareness or control over our existence. And we also have brainstem inside of midbrain. Okay, so where is the midbrain? So brainstem, uh, this will be a midbrain, so this will be for the brainstem. What is brainstem for? It connects the forebrain and spinal cord. It comprises the hypothalamus, thalamus, midbrain, and the brain. So there, that is why Midbrain, head brain, thalamus, and hypothalamus are interconnected to each other. It's because of the function of brainstem, because it is the one who connects for these um, regions. Okay. We also have head brain. Okay. The head brain comprises the medulla or oblongata. So this will be a medulla. This is responsible for controls heart activity and largely controls in breathing, swallowing, and also in digestion. So we also have pons. Pons, it is responsible or serve as a kind of relay station because it contains neural fibers that pass signals from one part of the brain to another. And pons came from the Latin word bridge. Okay, so let's look at This will be the pons. It serves as a bridging function. We also have cerebellum, okay? So for this part, this will be a cerebellum. This came from the Latin word, which means little brain. So what cerebellum for? It controls bodily coordination, balance, and muscle tone, as well as some aspects of memory involving related movements. So that is the function of 
cerebellum. So, for coordination and muscle movements. And also, with balance. Okay? We also have cerebral cortex. Okay? For cerebral cortex, it plays an important, it's an extremely um, role for a human condition. So, cerebral cortex is the outermost layer of the brain that consists of 80% of human brain. And it forms a regis, uh, a gyre rather, okay, it's, it's like a, a colon inside of the inside of the brain, okay, in singular gyrus that connected to each one, okay? And it also form with sulci, okay? In singular form, it's sulcus, okay? So what is the function for the cerebral cortex? The human cerebral cortex enables us to think. Because of this, we are unable to think and because of it, can plan, coordinate thoughts, action, perceive visual and sound patterns and use language without we would not be human okay the server the surface of cerebral cortex is grayish all right and also um it forms the outer layer of the two halves of the brain the left cerebral cortex and the right cerebral hemisphere okay so in part of that one we will find out the contralateral and ipsilateral we're going to discuss what is this for but to give you a brief one before we proceed to contralateral and ipsilateral, we have also to go with corpus callosum, okay? Corpus callosum is a dense aggregate of a neural fiber connecting the two cerebral hemisphere. Okay, so this will be a thick bundle of 200 to 300 million nerve fibers or a white matter that connects to left and right hemisphere. It allows transmission of formation back and forth. And if the corpus callosum cut, the two cerebral hemisphere or the two halves of the brain cannot communicate to each other. So, all right. So, what is now the hemisphere specialization and localization function? And how is this started? Okay. So, we have here Mark Dax. Mark Dax is a doctor from France in late... 1836, he treated 40 patients suffering from aphasia. So, for you to know, aphasia is a loss of speech as a result of brain damage. He studied brains after death. He saw that, Mark, Mark Dax saw that in every case, there had been a damage on the left hemisphere. However, he wasn't able to find which part of that left hemisphere is responsible for the speech okay and also we have paul broca paul broca discovered broca's area but before we proceed um to give you a brief introduction for Bro paul broca in late 1861 he is a french scientist that claims to autopsy and rebuild an aphasic stroke patient had a lesion in the left cerebral hemisphere of the brain in late 1864 Broca was convinced that the left hemisphere of the brain is critical in speech. And it views and the view of it was held over time. And this renamed that kind or the specific part of the brain for the left hemisphere as Broca's area. So it attributes to the speech. However, the specific part or lo localization of Broca's area hasn't discover yet. So, we have here Karl Wernick. Okay, so, who is this Karl Wernick? Karl Wernick is a German neurologist who studied language deficit of a patient who could speak but whose speech made no sense. So, it's like you are talking to something or is, um, there are voice coming out of your mouth. However, there is no substance if you're going to identify that kind of words to a patient. He traced that language ability to the left hemisphere also, just like what Mark Dax did. And he formally that this kind of region is responsible for language comprehension. And that specific region now called to his name, before his name, 
that's why we have Wernick area that is responsible for language comprehension. So we have Carl Wernick for language comprehension, and it called um, Wernick's area. Paul Broca for Broca's area that is responsible for speech. Okay, so we only have two for the specification of the brain in regards to speech. Okay, so what is this now, the ipsilateral and contralateral? Um, if, as you can see on this video, um, left hand of a person, if we say contralateral, that means that um, from one side to another. Okay, so left part of the brain, if you are left-handed, um, your right part of the brain functions. Okay, if you are right-handed, your left part of the brain functions. That means a uh, contralateral. So meaning to say, we have intersection. How is this, um, how it goes? Um, it's because of the um, corpus callosum who connects the left and right hemisphere of the brain. When we say ipsilateral, it, the transmission of the information is from one side to the other side. Meaning to say, if you are left-handed, part of people, uh, part type of person, your part, the part of the brain that is um, responsible, who is working for, or who is, um, which is functioning, is the left hemisphere of your brain as well. So contralateral, meaning to say, if you are left-handed, the part of the brain that functions in your brain is the right hemisphere. If if you are right-handed, the um, part of the brain or the hemisphere of the brain that functions inside of your brain is the left hemisphere. That's what we call contralateral. When we say ipsilateral, if you are left-handed, the part of the brain or the hemisphere of your brain is in left hemisphere also. And if you are right-handed, the hemisphere part of the brain that functions in you is the right hemisphere as well. Okay? So... Um, who started this kind of observation? We have here, first person is the car, Spencer Lashley, okay? He's the father of neuropsychology, and he found that um, implantation of crudely built electrodes in apparently identical loca um, location in the brain yielded different results. So um, what Carl Spencer Lashley did is like, he, um, he gave an electrodes to a person for him to be able to know which part of the brain functions well. Okay, so um, with this kind of research, um, he, he found um, this is very much limited because that time the, um, the technology is not that good enough. However, he found out that this kind of um, localization of the brain. Okay, now let's move to Roger Sperry. Roger Sperry invented the split brain bodies. Okay, so what is this split brain bodies? He argued that each hemisphere behaves in many respects like separate brain. Okay, so in his research study, um, he conducted 11 patients had their corpus callosum cut, okay? Corpus callo um that's what we call corpus callostomy, okay? For, to treat um, epileptic people. This procedure thereby drastically reduces the severity of the seizures. However, this procedure also results in a loss of communication between the two hemispheres, okay? So, what is happening to the person who has um uh, or an epileptic people okay um the epileptic people has seizures and for them to be able to treat we have to do something in regards to the uh corpus callosum because there are exaggerated movement of corpus callosum inside of the brain okay now let's move to gazaniga before we go to gazaniga let me just explain this one, what is this right brain and left brain functions for? When we say right brain functions, it is for responsible for awareness, art awareness, creativity, imagination, intuition, insight, holistic thought, music awareness, 3D forms, left hand control. 
Okay, so as what I was saying earlier, this one is for contralateral. Right brain functions will be for responsible for left hand control. Um, functions of left brain, fa left brain will be for analytical thought, logic, language, reasoning, science and math, written number skills, and right-handed person. Okay, so this uh, meaning to say, this one is also for contralateral. So what Gazzaniga did? Gazzaniga does not believe that the two hemispheres function completely independently, but rather that they serve complementary roles, okay? So, Gazzaniga in 1983 found that when each hemisphere's split brain patients were presented, the faces, the right hemisphere was much more able to recognize them, suggesting that the right hemisphere is specialized for facial recognition. So, what is this experiment that he conducted, Gazzaniga did? Um, for um, epileptic people, um, what he did is like, he covers the eye or the part of the eye of the person. Example would be, um, when I cover your eye, you can't see the image, okay? One of, um, example would be, I, I'll be covering your left eye. One of the, um, what you can see on the monitor will be the picture. However, you are unable to recognize that one. So, what he did is like, he let that person to draw what he seen on the picture on the board or on the computer. And then, after he draw, the person who is epileptic, that is um, only the time that he can recognize what inside of that picture. So, uh, with that experiment, according to Gazzaniga, that we need our two eyes for us to be able to recognize this specific picture okay because of um this eye of ours some is related to each other and we need the um we need this eye for us to be able to focus because uh if you're not going to see that one you can see the picture however you're unable to recognize the facial expression or the facial recognition on what you are seeing Okay, hope that one is clear. If you have questions, you can ask me during synchronous also. Alright, so we have loads of hemis cerebral hemisphere. Alright, so we have frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. Let me just see. Okay, for this slide, this will be a frontal lobe. It is like um, extended on your forehead. So um, this frontal lobe um, toward to the front of the brain and associated with motor processing and higher thought of processes such as abstract reasoning, problem solving, planning, and judgment. Why is that? Because there's a lot of um, localization inside of this um, frontal lobe. Okay, there's a lot of um, other things inside of this. There's a lot of neurochemicals inside of this. That is why it's responsible for planning um, problem solving, reasoning, and so on and so forth, okay? And these frontal lobes, we have prefrontal cortex, okay? So this region covers the frontal lobe that is involved for planning, complex cognitive behavior, personality, expression, decision-making, and moderating social behavior, okay? We also have parietal lobe. Parietal lobe, is it's like in your in Tagalog it's in Puyo of yours okay so it is the upper back portion of the brain and it is associated with um, somatosensory processing okay it receives inputs from the neurons regarding touch pain temperature senses dealing and reacting to environment okay um, you can also review what's inside of this um, why is that this part of the brain of the parietal lobe is responsible for touch, pain, temperature, and senses. What are the brain chemicals that inside of the parietal lobe? And we have also the temporal lobe. Okay, so temporal lobe is located in your temple, directly to your temples. It is associated with auditory processing language or language hearing and also in memory. In, this is also contains numerous of visual areas. Each specialization 
to analyze a specific aspect of the sense, including the color, motion, and location of that one. Next would be occipital, oh, sorry, the um, occipital node is responsible for numerous visual areas and specialized to the analyze a specific aspect and scene, including color, motion, locations, okay? Not the temporal lobe as what I was saying earlier. Temporal lobe is only responsible for language, hearing, and memory. Okay, so we are now here in occipital load. It is associated with visual processing at, uh, as what I was saying. Um, this will be located at your more on batok of yours. Okay, um, mas malapit siya dun sa batok. That is why. Um, since that this is uh, responsible for mo motion, um, in Filipino TV, um, if we want to kill someone or we want that person to be unconscious is that this is um, related to the spinal cord and nearest to the spinal cord, the occipital lobe, and you get in matai, um, you have to uh, may matay ka and mawawala ka na malay sa ginagawa mo kapag natamaan si occipital lobe because that is responsible for motion. That is why also if that person get unconscious or got a damage to the occipital lobe, what happened is that he blacked out because that is responsible for visual processing. Okay? And we have neurons. Neurons, we have billions of neurons inside of our brain. As we go older, our neurons get um, degenerate or nababawasan. It lessens as time goes by. Okay? So, as we go grow older, our neurons um, die. Okay? And so, inside of this new year, there's a lot of specific function for this one. So, um, neurons is, it is an individual neural cells, okay? It transmits electrical signals from one location to another inside of the nervous system, okay? In neurons as well, we have neurocortex. So, in neurocortex, it is the greatest concentration of neuron and that this tissue contain as many as 100,000 neurons per cubic millimeter. So, imagine how many um, neurons that a person has. And also, we have soma. Okay. So, um, let me just go with my slides. Okay. This is what I was saying earlier. Okay. So, this will be a neocortex part. Okay. And... Neocortex, let me repeat, this is a tissue that contains of 100 neurons per cubic millimeter. Okay? And we have soma. Um, I hope that we have soma. Okay, this will be a soma. Soma contains nuclei of the cell. So this will be a soma. It contains a nuclei. This will be a nuclei of the cell. Okay? So this is the black dot. Okay? Let me just use my drawing. Okay, so this will be a soma. Okay, this, that, black, that. Alright, so, soma is responsible for the life of neurons and connects the dendrites to the axon. Alright, so we have here axon. Okay, what is this axon for? Axon is a long, thin tube. This will be the axon. It's a long, thin tube that extends to sometimes it splits from the soma and responsible to the information when appropriate by transmitting an electrochemical signal which travel to the terminus or to the end this will be the end okay the terminus and where the signal can be transmitted to the other part of neurons okay so it extends that is axon 4 and we also have your myelin okay myelin is a white fatty substance that surrounds some of the axons of the nervous system which contains of some of the whiteness of the white matter of the brain so this will be inside of that um we are able to find the myelin inside of this one because it is covered by the myelin sheet okay so myelin sheet insulates and protects the longer axon from electrical interference by other neurons in the area it also speeds up the conduction of information so um for, for you to be able 
to make fasten the information that inside of your brain and to travel the information, you have to eat fatty acids foods or the fatty foods. But a healthy fast fatty foods, just like peanuts, tuna, and other healthy food that that has a lot of fatty acids for you to be able to transmit that information fast okay because it is good for the myelin sheet and myelin to transmit signals so that is why when we say kumain ka naman eh, if you want it to be intelligent um that's true because of mane has a fatty acid a uh, natural fatty acid that helps to transform the information inside of the myelin sheet or the myelin to transmit signals because myelin sheet helps the transmission of the signals okay so uh, how fast is this transmission of myelin native axons can reach up to 100 meters per second so that will be equal to about 224 miles per hour so imagine how fast the myelin sheet transform to the other neurons next will be the, the generation of myelin sheets however um, along with axon is certain nerves is associated with multiple sclerosis so if um, your myelin sheet got degenerate um, it is responsible or you will be having a multiple sclerosis an autoimmune disease it is results in impairment of coordination and also in balance that is why many people when they get older they're unable to move fast right it's because of the myelin sheet next we also have here the nodes of randier let me just erase here my drawing notes so that i could also input the nodes of randier okay so this will be a nodes of randier what is this nodes of randier for it is the small gaps inside in the myelin okay so it coats along the axon which serves to increase conduction speeds even more by helping to create electrical signals and also called potentials okay we also have your terminal button for this part and what is this terminal button for and these are the small nodes found at the end of the branches of an axon that do not directly touch the dendrite of the next neuron rather there are there is a very small gap which is the synapse what is this synapse for synapse serves as a juncture between the terminal button of one or more neurons and the dendrites so sometimes the soma one of the more new more other neurons so meaning to say um for each neuron it is not connected however it transmits an information because they see that send signal and that um each neuron has a synapse okay or the synapse this synapse transmit to the other um electron to the other neuron okay so it connects it is like an electricity who which um fires an electricity that's why on the past lesson we mentioned the neuroplasticity so when um neuroplasticity just to recall when um when it fires it wires right that neuroplasticity is um neurons is a single cell okay it's connect it connects to another um neurons because of the firing of that one and the one who is responsible for firing of that is the synapse okay so um for this part synapse is important for cognition okay decreased cognitive function may result to alzheimer's disease that is why um people having an alzheimer's disease because of the decreasing or the a malfunctioning of the synapse okay it is associated with reduced efficiency of synaptic transmission to the nerve impulses okay and we have neurotransmitter okay so this will be a neurotransmitter okay so neurotransmitter are the chemical messenger of the transmission of information across the synaptic gap to the receiving dendrites of next neuron okay so there are three types of chemical substance that involves a neurotransmitter we have monoamine neurotransmitter are synthesized 
by nervous system through enzymatic actions on one of the amino acids. So these amino acids are constituents of proteins such as choline, tyrosine, and tyrotopan. You may search on that. What is this responsible for? Okay. And we also have amino acid neurotransmitter. This Amino acid neurotransmitters are obtained directly from amino acids in our diet without further synthesis. So, example would be the GABA or the gamma amino butyric acid or the GABA, what I said earlier. We also have neuropeptides. These neuropeptides are chains okay, of molecules made from the part of one or more amino acids. So we have to dissect what is the responsible of each neurotransmitter and if the and if this neurotransmitter are for mono amino neurotransmitter, amino acid neurotransmitter or neuropeptides part. Okay, so we have acetylcholine, okay, or as an abbreviation of AS oh sorry, ACH. This acetylcholine is a monoamine neurotransmitter transmitter that is synthesis, um, neurotransmitter synthesized from choline. Okay, so the general function of acetylcholine would be for excitatory in brain and either excitatory at the skeletal muscles or inhibitory. Um, this is where the heart muscle as well in the body also goes. Um, because of the acetylcholine, um, our heart... Um, becomes good in this kind of functioning because um, there is um, a neurotransmitter or the monoamine neurotransmitter is responsible for that. It is also believed that it is involved in memory because of high concentrated pump in hippocampus. Okay, next will be dopamine. All right, one moment. Let me go back. What is the hippocampus for? Hippocampus is like a seahorse type or structure. Okay, it plays essential role in memory. Okay, so that is why um, there is an acetylcholine there. Okay, so we have to move now for dopamine. What is dopamine for and what is the function of this one? Dopamine is a monoamine neurotransmitter that synthesizes from tyrosine okay so the general function of dopamine is it influences the movement attention and learning mostly inhibitory but some excitatory effect so it is believed that um people who is a uh, malfunction of dopamine in the brain can result to parkinson's disease okay and also in schizophrenia all right so um, it says here that Parkinson's disease characterized by tremors and limb rigidity. It results from too little of dopamine. When the person has too little of dopamine, um, it will cause a disease of Parkinson. Okay? If it's too high of dopamine inside of your brain, it will result to schizophrenia. Okay, so do not be confused in um, in regards to that one. Um, low in dopamine results in Parkinson's disease, and high in dopamine results to schizophrenia. Next, we have epinephrine and norepinephrine. These two are monoamine neurotransmitters that synthesize from tyrosine also, and the general function is hormones, also known as adrenaline or non-adrenaline it involves regulation and alertness so meaning to say epinephrine and norepinephrine is responsible for fight and flight response so it involves in diverse effects on the body related to the fight or flight reaction anger and fear so because of that um epinephrine and norepinephrine you feel the emotion of fear and anger okay Next, we have serotonin. What is this serotonin for? This is a monoamine neurotransmitter also from tritopan. Okay, it involves 
in arousal, sleep and dreaming and mood. Usually inhibitory but some excitatory effects. So meaning to say, the one that we are mentioning earlier, the, the nacrolepsy has something to do with the low or high of serotonin inside of the brain of a people who has a nacrolepsy because it is responsible for sleep and also in mood. So a specific example of serotonin, serotonin is normally inhibits dreaming the um, defects in serotonin system are linked to the severe depression. Next, we have GABA or the gamma amino uh, GABA amino butyric acid. Okay, so the general function of this one it uh, affect resulting from inhibitory influences to the presynaptic axon. So, a specific example for GABA is currently believed to influence certain mechanism for learning and also for memory. Just like in schizophrenia person and autism, they are having a hard time to recognize certain things in also in learning. So, if a uh, person that has autism um, sees that um, some of them are having a hard time in regards to their memory and um, Alzheimer's disease people, um, there has something wrong with their GABA, okay? Because of this is responsible for um, learning and also in memory. Just also in Alzheimer's disease, okay? Since that this is Alzheimer's disease, are, these are the people who are forgetting something, um, there, there, um, there has a problem with their GABA. Okay, next will be glutamate. So, glutamate is an amino acid neurotransmitter. So, general neuro, neuromodulatory effect resulting from excitatory and influences in presynaptic axons. So, a specific example for this one is currently believed that to influence certain mechanisms for learning and memory. The person who has schizophrenia has something to do with the malfunction of GABA. It might be too much of glutamate excitatory inside of the brain or too low glutamate. Okay, so high and low glutamate is responsible for schizophrenia, not only by the one that I discussed earlier. Okay, that is responsible only for schizophrenia, the dopamine. So, um, dopamine and glutamate is both of these um, neurotransmitters are responsible for um, its schizophrenia because both of these are in monoamine neurotransmitter. Okay. Next, but not the least, will be the neuropeptides. What is this neuropeptides? Neuropeptides are the peptide chains serving as neurotransmitters. So. Um, general neuromodulatory effect resulting from influence on postsynaptic membrane and endorphin rather play a role in pain relief. Neuromodulating neuropeptides sometimes are released to enhance the effect of acetylcholine. So, what is endorphin for? Endorphin is for pain relief or um, pain. Um, responsible for pain of a person do not ever forget the end what is endorphin for okay so all right so um viewing the structure and functions of the brain okay we have different kinds on how are we going to study the parts of the brain okay the first one is the post-mortem post-mortem came from the latin word after death okay so this will be a dissection of the study or relation between the brain and also in behavior so researcher observed the documents that the behavior of people who show signs of brain damage while they are alive okay it's just like what happened to Phineas cage uh, Phineas cage incident we all know that what happened to Phineas cage he got hit by the rod while working in a chain okay on a chain rather okay so um, the brain of Phineas Cage is studied after the death of him. So they use post-mortem to identify which part of the localization of the brain got hit by the rod. That's why the behavior of Phineas Cage changed as time goes by. Next, we have in vivo. In vivo 
came from the Latin word meaning living. Okay, so to study the changing activity of the living brain, scientists must use in vivo research. So in vivo research is usually used for animals just like a sheep, a rat, and other um, non-human animals. So to obtain single cell recording, researcher inserted a very thin electrode next to a single neuron in the brain of an animal. So usually um, researcher use a monkey or cat, okay, for them to be able to use as an experiment. The, then they record the changes in electrical activity that occur in the cell when the animal is exposed to a stimulus, okay? We also have in vivo, which is the selective reasoning. What is the selective reasoning for? This is for surgically removing the damaged part of the brain. Okay, so to observe resulting functional deficit. So what happened to a brain is like, um, um, you have to cut it out. You have to lesion this one, and you have to examine which part of the brain um that is responsible of that one. So that is selective lesioning means. Okay, and also um we have different type of recording. We have your electroencephalogram. Phallogram. What is this encephalogram for? Or the electroencephalogram? Or what we call EEG. EEG are the recording of the electrical frequencies and intensifies of living brain. Okay, so typically recorded over a relatively long period. So through EEG, it is possible to study the brain wave activity indicator of changing mental states such as deep sleep or dreaming. So what happened to this EEG? Um, it has red, usually red and black line. If there has something to do with you while you are asleep, um, the line got um, flattened or sometimes it got um, in a wave form. Okay, so um, doctor or the one who is responsible to study the EEG may find something if there's something wrong inside of your brain by using or by plotting an electrode um, outside of your, in your head, um, on your head rather. Okay, we also have event-related potential therapy. What is this for? It is the record of the small change in the brain electrical activity in response to stimulating event. Okay, so what happened to this? If um, you have this kind of thing that is um, inserted or connected uh, in, on your head, Okay, so um, there will be a stimulus that will be appearing inside, um, in front of you. And if there's um, a stimulus of you um, that you've seen um, react to the specific part of your brain. So this will be goes like this. Okay, kunyar, may nakita ka something that um, it hints you. Um, there will be a... Um, reaction inside of your brain and the one who is response the one who is expert for this one will be recorded if there has something to do with that kind of stimulus of yours okay we also have static imaging techniques so um, static imaging techniques so we have the x-ray based techniques or the angiogram and CT scan so, it allows of observation of a large abnormalities of the brain, such as damage resulting from stroke or tumor. So, if you have tumor, stroke, what you have to do is to have this kind of angiogram, um, CT scan, for them to be able, if we can, if you have tumor inside of your brain. So, however, they are limited, okay? So, this angiogram CT scan is limited to the resolution and cannot provide much information about smaller lesions and aberrations, okay? So, computed tomography, CT, or the CAT scan, unlike conventional X-ray methods that only allow a two-dimensional view of an object, a CT scan can consist of several X-ray images of the brain taken from different vantage points that, when combined, results in three-dimensional image okay so the aim of angiography do not ever forget this one is not to look the structure of the brain but rather to examine the blood flow okay the um aim of the angiogram is to look not to look the structure but 
to see the blood flow of the brain. So, in angiography, um, there is a dye that will be injected to the artery and leads to the brain. The, and then the X-ray image is taken. Okay, so there, there will be um, observed what is aligned to the blood flow, flow of the um, patient. We have also MRI, okay? MRI scan is great for interest in cognitive psychologies. And we have several, uh, we have two kinds of MRI. We have um, the structural MRI and functional MRI. So what is the structural MRI for? It provides an image that brain size and shapes. The functional MRI is a neuroimaging technique that uses magnetic field to construct a detailed representation in three dimension. Okay, so this is much high tech than the structural MRI, the functional MRI. So it visualizes the parts of the brain um, that are active when a person is engaged in a particular task. You can identify that one by using fMRIs because uh, this one is a series of 3D volumes. Okay, and that is also in line to a detailed representation of what's happening inside of your brain. Next, we have PET scan. Okay, so PET or positron emission tomography scan measure increasing in oxygen consumption in active brain areas during particular kinds of information processing. Okay, so that is the end of this lesson number two. Or if you have questions, you may ask me during synchronous. We know already what are the um, kind of scan. We have um, functional MRI. We have also a structural MRI. What is this for? We also tackle the parts of the brain, the midbrain, forebrain, in brain, and the parietal, occipital, temporal, and um, we also tackle the parietal, occipital, temporal, and also the frontal lobe of the brain. Okay, the neurotransmitter, the monoamine neurotransmitter, uh, mono, monoamine acid, the dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, epinephrine, and what is this responsible for? And if you have low in dopamine, what will cause you or what kind of disease that you can get, okay? Or what is this um, glutamate is responsible, um, schizophrenia has something to do with their glutamate and dopamine, okay? So th those things are the recap and the things that um, we have discussed for you for today, okay? If you still have questions, you may ask me during synchronous and please answer activity number two that you have on your module. Thank you for listening and goodbye for now.